Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, sir, I'm, I'm Chris, and the man at the back is also Chris. And uh, the reason he's filming is that uh, I'm involved with a project called South Downs Generations, and that's really, as the name suggests, working with people of all generations, from your age right up to the oldest people, to record memories about the South Downs, their history, how they've changed, why people like the South Downs. So that's why I'm here, really, um, because history is my subject, and, uh, and I was asked to talk about medieval times. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? when you talk about dates, what does a date mean? Someone says 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. It's hard to put that in perspective. But if you think about your ages, you're, what, 9, 10, 11, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So you're twice the age or more of the children in reception. Uh, but your parents are probably 35, 40, 45. Um, and grandparents in their 70s. Has anyone got great-grandparents? Okay, so what sort of ages are they? Um, 90. 90, wow. Yeah? 91. 91. Yes? 95. 95. Anyone better than 95? Okay, 95 is the tops. <laughs> so that, and, and they, I'm sure to you, they seem very old. Um, but in terms of what I'm talking about today, you know, 95 years of age, I'm talking about 950 years ago, you know, 10 times as long. So it's pretty hard, isn't it? It's probably quite hard for you to imagine what it was like being 10 or 11 when your grandparents were that age. So what was it like living then? So to try and imagine what it was like living um, in the 900s, 10s, 11, 1200s, it's really, really difficult. And it was completely different from anything you could understand or imagine. So I'm going to try to give some idea of what medieval life was like. And I'm starting with this picture that you've probably been looking at. Now this is a king, and um, you can just about make out his name at the top, but it's in old script, old writing. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to what his name is at the top? Yes? Alfred Ref. That's pretty good. Yes? Alfred. Alfred, yes. Uh, and Alfred was king of England, and, he's, and we've had in this country so many kings and queens. Uh, our current queen, of course, is very old, and her husband only died a few weeks ago. Uh, she's the oldest queen or king we've ever, ever had by a long, long way. But this king, he was called Alfred the Great. Now, if you look at, look at our, you know, our present queen is Queen Elizabeth II, and before that, her father was king, and he was George VI, and before that was Edward VIII, and George V, and Edward VII, and Queen Victoria. So they either have names, like Queen Victoria, or if there's been more than one, like we've had two Elizabeths, then it's Elizabeth II. So it's quite unusual for a king or queen to be called the Great, Alfred the Great. He's the only king or queen ever in the history of our country who's been called the Great. So he must have done something pretty important to be called Great. Uh, so, we come on to. Uh, this is a beautiful jewel that was made, and the writing on it, which you can just see on the bottom there, said, Alfred had me made, Alfred made me. Uh, and that was made over 1,000 years ago. So, you think of your great grandparents in their 90s, you know, 10 times longer in the past. But even though it's such a long time ago, the people living there were still skilled and knowledgeable and could still produce something as beautiful as that without any modern technology, uh, all with gold and precious stones. Uh, so that tells us that Alfred had access to skilled people and to wealth, and uh, he wasn't a poor king. But his real reason for being called great was because of these people. I don't know how well you can see that picture. Uh, but that shows fighting going on. And um, does anyone know, possibly someone here might know, who the English were fighting 1,000 years ago? And the people who came from Scandinavia had a particular name. Yes? Vikings. Vikings, very good. 
the Vikings. Now, uh, so they came from what's modern day Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. And they came to take over the land here in England, not peacefully, but by force, by violence. Um, and there were lots of battles and wars. And the Vikings were so warlike that they beat the English. And the amount of land that the English had got smaller and smaller and smaller until there was just a small bit left in what we now call the West Country. Do you know the term the West Country? Anyone know what, what sort of county is in the West Country? Maybe not sure been there. Who's been on holiday to Denver? Or Dorset? Yeah, quite a few of you. So that's, that's what we could call the West Country. But in the days of King Alfred, it was called Wessex. So we live in Sussex. And back in those days, there was somewhere called Wessex. And that was the only part of England that the English still controlled. And Alfred created this very powerful army. And he also created the first navy. The first navy England ever had, which of course were sailing boats and small sailing boats. Um, and he beat the Vikings. He was victorious. But what was, made him really great wasn't just that he beat them in battle, but that he made peace with them. So rather than you know, put them all in prison or kill their leaders, he said, OK, we'll make a deal. And the deal was that England was divided in half. And the north of England was given to the Vikings, and the south of England was given to the English, or the, or the Saxons, as they were known then. Now, have any of you ever noticed, and perhaps you've got, perhaps you've got relatives who live in the north of England, in Yorkshire or Lancashire. Anyone got relatives in Yorkshire or Lancashire? Quite a lot of you. And then have any of you been to Yorkshire or Lancashire? Not quite so many. Have you noticed that people in the north of England speak in a different way to people in the south of England? It's like a Yorkshire accent. And it's quite different. You, hear, you know it straight away, don't you? If someone's from the north of England, within a few seconds, you go, oh, they're not from the south, they're from the north. And have you ever wondered why people in the south sound different to people in the north? What do you think? <laughs> but you've thought about it. Yes? Maybe because like, the Vikings going over there, like, kind of over the country, so... Yes. That's, that's absolutely right. The way they speak in the north is because they... That way they speak comes from the fact that they used to be Vikings, and the people in the south were Saxons. So they, in fact, they'd have spoken completely different languages in those days. Now, now we all speak the same language, but we've still got those different accents. And that still means that after a thousand years, we can still think, ah, that person's got a Yorkshire accent because they lived in what was called the Dane Law. Where the Vikings had power, it was called Dane Law. And York was their capital, called Jorvik. Um, so even though so many years have passed, we can still tell of that influence. Uh, and Alfred did other things. Um, he, uh, he read a lot, and people didn't really read in those days. Um, people didn't really read in those days at all. So I'm pretty sure that everyone in this classroom today can read. Um, and you probably read a lot of books on the internet. But if, if we went back a thousand years, and there was a room full of 10 and 11 year olds, probably none of them could read. The only people who could read were monks, religious people, or someone like Alfred, who was a king. And he encouraged reading. So that was, that was another reason why he was called great. And he invented things. He invented... In fact, when I came into the classroom, um, I was looking at this wonderful clock you've got. And that's amazing, because hardly any of these clocks still exist in schools. Um, but that reminded me that Alfred the Great invented the first clock. But not a clock like that. And certainly not a clock like the one on the wall over there, which works by battery. Uh, his clock was a candle, a great big tall candle. And so he, he got a candle that he knew would last for a whole day, for 24 hours. From the time he lit it to the time it completely burnt down to the bottom would take one day. And he drew little lines across it, 24 lines. So how far the candle burnt down, he'd know what hour it was. Burnt down one bit, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. 
So that was pretty clever. And before that, people didn't really have any idea of time. They knew when it was dark and they went to bed, and they knew when the sun came up, they got up, and in between they worked. But they had no sense of 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, or anything like that. So um, he, was a, he was a great king. But um, going back to the Vikings and those dangerous times, who recognises where that is? Yes? Sisbury Ring. Sisbury Ring. Um, and you'll see on the top I've put the Royal Mint. Has anyone got any idea what the Royal Mint is? And it still exists today. Bit of a tough question. It's not a sweet. That's, it's not a very, it's not special sweets that kings eat. Um, it's the place where they produce money. So coins, 50p's, one pound coins, five pound notes, 10 pound notes. They're all produced at the Royal Mint. And the making of money is called the minting of money. And during the time I'm talking about, when the English were fighting the Vikings and there were wars and battles, the English kings didn't want their money to be seized by the Vikings. And in those days, the money was gold and silver coins. So they wanted the, the coins to be somewhere safe. So they put that they, they had the royal mint for about 20 years on Sisbury Ring because they could defend it. Um, and uh, if you go up Sisbury Ring, you know there's a ditch. And that ditch used to be much deeper. And you'll see there's an earth bank. That bank used to be higher. And on top of the bank was a wooden wall. So they thought, that's the place to make our coins. And they were made there for about uh, 20 years until things were more peaceful. And they could uh, put it back into a town. It didn't have to be up on a defended hill. So here we are to about reading and writing. Uh, and here's a monk. Does anyone, what, what, anyone know what a monk is? Yes? Um, is it like someone who goes to church and they wear those robes? They wear robes. Yeah, any other ideas? Yes? So like really, really religious people. Very religious people, yeah. Um, and does anyone know where monks live? Yes? I was going to say in amongst tribes, possibly. Well, they could do. Uh, they could do, but they, tend, they often live in a building which has a particular name. Yes? Because very like almost, you're almost right, a monastery. Have you heard of monastery or abbeys? Uh, so, and there are still monks today. They still exist. But in Alfred's time, they were very important. They were very important for three reasons. Firstly, because they were religious, everyone thought they were closer to God. And God is so important a thousand years ago. People completely believe in God, and they completely believe if you pray to God, then God will help you. And uh, they would have thought the reason that they beat the Vikings was because God was helping them. And these monks were praying night and day for that. So that's one reason they're important. The other reason they were important is because they helped the poor. So if you were poor, if you were ill, or if you were very old, and there was no one to look after you, you'd go to a monastery, and the monks would take you in and look after you. Uh, and the third very important thing about them, which you can see there, look, there's a monk, and above him were all those bookshelves, and all the books. But books weren't produced then like your books are, all the books you've got in front of you. How do you think books were produced a thousand years ago? Uh, someone I haven't asked. Uh, yes, you. Yes. Oh, they could have been like on a scroll, sort of. They often were on scrolls. So how would that be made? Oh, like a handwritten. Handwritten. That's exactly it. Handwritten. Every single book was handwritten. So a monk might be writing a book, and perhaps it might take him a year to write it. And the king may say, "Oh, I like this book. Let's have another copy." Oh, right. But they go back for another year and write them. Anyone know where that is? Yes. It's not Finden. Somewhere not as near. Yes. No, not closer than that. It's uh, something. So if you go to, uh, if you ever go with your parents on the A27 towards Brighton. As you're heading on the A27, on your left, you'll see this spire. 
Now the reason I put that picture up is because I said that the Vikings came from Norway, Denmark, uh, and Sweden. The Saxons originally came from what's now Germany. And if you go to some parts of Germany today, you'll see lots of church that looks like that, with those spires, with that really strange roof, which is called a Rhenish helm. That's the, that's the name for it. Very unusual. I think there's only about four churches in England with spires like that. Uh, and there's lots of them in, in Westphalia in Germany, because that's where the Saxons came from originally. But that was even more than a 1,000 years ago. That was 1,500, 1,600 years ago. Now this is, that's, this is a beautiful, this is, this is an embroidery, so it's not a painting, this has been made with needlework. And it shows three women and their abbesses. Now this is a pretty tough question, does anyone know what an abbess is? Yes? It's like head of nuns or something. Brilliant, yeah, it's head of nuns, it's precisely that. And a nun is a female monk, same as a monk, but a woman. And, and in Anglo-Saxon England, Abbesses were, were very, very important uh, because they were regarded as especially holy and especially clever. Uh, and one thing to remember is you may think, oh, you know, a thousand years ago they weren't as clever as us. Well, no, they didn't know probably hardly anything that you know today. But on the other hand, they knew lots of stuff that you don't know, that I don't know. They could probably, the whole Bible was probably in their memory. You could ask them, oh, uh, St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, and they tell you what it was. They, they put the whole thing to memory. Uh, and often they had a lot of history in their minds. The history of the English Saxon people. They wouldn't be in a book, it would be in their memory. They learnt it. Uh, and they were considered very wise, and people often went to abbesses. If they had a real problem or difficulty, the abbess would often try and, and sort it out. Um, but. They, men and women were separate, so uh, uh, an ab where an abbey, uh, an abbey or a convent where the nuns were, we didn't have men and women together. But they were, they, what they did was similar. They were praying, they were writing, they were observing, and they were helping the poor. And that would have taken a long time to produce that. Something as beautiful as that would have taken a long time. So it shows how important those women were. Uh, and you see on top of their heads, here. Uh, anyone know what we call that? You should probably see it on Christmas cards sometimes. It's a halo. So it's showing their goodness, their godliness, that, that, that they are, by drawing that on, it doesn't mean that when you saw them you actually saw that, it's just a representation to say that they're holy women and they are in contact with God. And that's why they're important. And that's why they were respected. Um, so, kings and queens. Uh, this is Queen Ethelfleda. Um, I'm pretty sure there's no one in the class today called Ethelfleda. Um, the old English had names that you rarely hear now. Uh, and Ethelfleda was very important because she was Queen of Mercia. So remember I said there was Wessex. And, this is something, there was even a king of Sussex. So long, long ago, Sussex, where we all live, was a kingdom with its own king. Uh, and Mercia was what today we call the Midlands. Uh, Birmingham, Wolverhampton, Coventry, those sort of places. And she was Queen of Mercia, and she was um, a daughter of Alfred the Great. And when the Vikings came again and there were more wars, she led troops in battle. And the, little, and the boy standing next to her, who was about 10 when shown in that uh, sculpture, uh, his name was Athelstan. Again, I don't, well, sometimes I've heard actually children now called Athelstan. Does anyone know an Athelstan? They might just be called Stan, probably for sure. But Athelstan was the first king to be king of the whole of England. Right from here where we are on the south coast, right up to Yorkshire and Northumberland. So even the Vikings acknowledged him as king. So Athelstan was a very powerful king, and, uh, but he would never have been king if it hadn't been for Queen Ethelfleda 
uh, and the wars she fought. Uh, and there's another queen, her name was Wolfram. Um, so if, yeah, if, if your parents have more children, or your aunt, uncles and aunts, and they can't think of a name, suggest Wolfram. <laughs> that would be, pre be a pretty good name, actually, Wolfram. I quite like it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Wolfram was a Now, when we think of medieval England, we tend to think of this sort of thing, of knights and castles. But I'm talking about an earlier time before Knights and Castles. I'm going to come on to Knights and Castles, but the time of Alfred the Great, Ethelflaeda, Athelstan, no castles. Monasteries, yes, churches, yes, but not castles. What they did have were defences like Sisbury Ring. Uh, or, do, you, do any of you know Bertham near Arundel? You may have been there, perhaps had a meal at the pub. Uh, Bertham was a Saxon fort, but it wasn't a castle, so it was a big earth bank all the way around it with a wooden, a wooden, big wooden fence, what's called a palisade. Uh, that's, that's what they built. They didn't build castles of stone at that time. Um, and this, this, is, this is what we call like a symbolic picture. Um, what, do, what do we mean if we say something symbolic? Yeah? Doesn't it mean like it represents like, but it's not actually what it is? Yeah, it, re it represents more than, than just what you're looking at. It's, it's telling you a second story, really. Uh, so this shows King Athelstan, this is when he's grown up and King of England, uh, with St Cuthbert, who was Archbishop of Canterbury. So he was head of the church in England. And so it's a representation showing you King Athelstan and the Archbishop. But the symbolism is that the king is bowing his head to the archbishop and the king is giving the archbishop a present of a book. So what he's saying is, even though I'm the most powerful king England has ever had, I'm one of the most powerful kings in Europe, I'm bowing my head to the archbishop because God is more powerful than I am. And, and, and that's, that's the symbolism of it. Uh, the church, in the end, is more powerful than the king. So I've talked about I've talked about rich and powerful people. I've talked about kings and queens and abbesses and monks. But now to talk about the ordinary people. And 99% of people were, were poor people. And there were also there was a lot less of them. Does anyone know how many people live in England today? Yeah. There's also 72 million. Yeah, that's for the whole of... Uh, that's England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, you're absolutely right. But England, just England alone, any idea? Yeah. 67 million. Getting closer, 50 million. 50 million people live in England, but as you said, it's over 70 million for the whole country. It's 50 million. In the times I'm talking about, there were probably about one and a half million people. So far, far less people than there are now. I think and that's what was in Baghdad. It's something like a million, just over a million, in around a million, in the city of yeah. Baghdad. So in the city of Baghdad, it was the same as we had in England, the, the same city. The whole of England. And, uh, and the capital of England, what's the capital of England today? Yeah. London. London, that's an easy question. The capital of England in the time of Alfred and Athelstan uh, was Winchester. Do you, do you know Winchester? It's not so far from here in Hampshire. That was where, and that, if you, that is where all these ancient kings are buried. They're not buried in London, they're buried in Winchester. Because Winchester was the capital of Wessex before it became the capital of England. But London became the new capital because it was on a river. And because it was on a river, boats bringing in things to eat or things to wear or other products would sail up the Thames. And so London gradually became the biggest place. But uh, I think the population of London today, depending on how you count it, is about 9 million people in London. In those days, it was about 20,000 people. So London in Saxon times was probably not much bigger than Finden is today. <laughs> so that makes you think, doesn't it, how, how few people there were living in England at that time. So what are these people doing on the picture, if you can see it? Any idea? Uh, yeah. 
They're plowing the fields. And what are the animals they're using to, plow, to pull the plow? Uh, someone I haven't asked. Uh, you have any idea what animal? Oh. Did you say it? Ox. Ox. They're oxen, yeah. <laughs> um, and why do you think they're using oxen rather than, say, horses? Yeah. It's the, like, a bit more heavier and they're a bit more stronger. Yeah, heavier and stronger. And why would they need to be heavier and stronger? Because there is more things to do. Yeah, and, and because a lot of the land, particularly in Sussex, was heavy, heavy clay mud. And if you, I don't know if you at school you make things out of clay at all, but if you ever made anything out of clay, you know how thick it is. And when you get clay in mud, and when you get lots of rain, rain, clay and mud, it's thick, awful stuff. I, I went for a walk with my wife, I think it was in January, we went over to Hurstmonceau in East Sussex, and we were walking and our feet were sinking in the mud. Have you ever done that when you've been for a walk and you've, you've, you've sunk into the mud because it's so dirty? Um, that's what it was like. A horse wouldn't be strong enough. Only, and they've got, what, four oxen. Four oxen just to pull one plough. And that would probably take all day to plough up the field, uh, to plant the crops. And, when, and then when the crops grew, um, what are they doing there, do you think? Um, yes. They're collecting it. Yeah, they're, 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 and can you see what they're, how they're cutting it? They've got, if I go and show you, that man's holding one up here. They're sort of like curved knives on a stick. Do you know what they're called? Yeah? Is it a sickle? A sickle. That's exactly what they call a sickle. Um, now, um, in the summer, in late summer, August, I'm sure you've noticed in the fields around here, the farmers would combine harvesters, bringing in all the harvest, huge, great machines. They had to do it all by hand. So with a sickle, going through all the crop, cutting it down, cutting it down, lifting it under their arm, taking it away, um, combine harvester can clear a field in maybe two hours. It would probably take 50 people all day to clear a field in Saxon times. So everything took so much longer to do than it would take today. Okay, dragons and monsters. Who believes in dragons? Nobody. You're all. And why don't you believe in dragons? Yeah. Because there's never been any like skeletons or scientific proof that they exist. Yes. So you want evidence. You say they're not real. There's no evidence. But in the Saxon times, they didn't think like that at all. They didn't think about evidence. They just believed what they believed. And uh, there's a very old book called the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And in there it tells you all the things that were happening in England at that time. And often they say, before something bad happened, fiery dragons were seen in the sky. So these people really believe in dragons. And, but some people, even today in our world, they may not believe in dragons, but have you, maybe you know people in your family or on television, people who believe in UFOs and flying saucers and people landing from other planets, have you? Anyone met people who believe that? Yes. My brother does. Your brother believes it, you see. So... It's quite hard not to believe. How can we be the only human beings in And that, that's, the, that's the feeling, isn't it? See, it's not evidence. You're feeling there must be something else. And they had the same feeling, but of course they didn't have any idea of planets or space travel. They couldn't think of that. So they imagined there were these monsters and spirits and all sorts of strange things that existed, not really in this world, but in another world. Um, 
Um, do, you, do you all know Arundel? And um, near Arundel is a little village called Liminster, which you may not. Have you heard of Liminster? Uh, some of them calling you say, yes, you have. <laughs> Mr. Dragon. <laughs> what do you mean no one believes in me? Um, yes, yeah, so if you go to the little village of Liminster, there's a church in Liminster, and near Liminster Church is a pond, a small lake. And it's called, even today, if you look on maps, if, if you go home this evening and ask your mum and dad if they've got a, a map of West Sussex, if you find Liminster, you'll find the little pond on the map. And it's called the Nucker Hole. And Nucker is an old English word for dragon or sea serpent. Just listen very carefully to this, because this will be useful for next half term as well. Okay, well. Uh, yes? It's like the pond. Well, that's an artist's impression. So I wrote a book about four or five years ago about legends. And an artist did some, because usually if you're writing a book, just like I've been showing you pictures of kings and queens, you, you've got to put a dragon in, but there aren't many pictures of dragons, are there? <laughs> so I got an artist to make one up. And so this is the story of the, of the Nucker Hole. And the story is that the Nucker Hole was bottomless. And at the bottom of the bottomless pond, which doesn't make any sense, but doesn't matter, lived the Nucker. And occasionally it would get very hungry, and it would come up to the top of the pond, put its head up, sniff the air, oh, some cows over there, eat the cows. Oh, there's some sheep over there, eat the sheep. And if it's really hungry, there are some people over there, eat the people. And the legend is that in the end, a very brave local man called Jim Putton made a great big pie that he poisoned. And he put the poisoned pie on a wagon, and he took the wagon, the knuckle hole and the dragon came out and sniffed the air and ate up the pie and ate up the horses and ate up the wagon too and it was poisoned and it killed the knucker. <laughs> um, and if you go to Livingston Church, even though this is a legend, uh, and what do we mean by legend? Uh, someone who hasn't... Uh, still have your hand over, talk about Monday. Legends, go on, yes. Uh, it's not what i um, saying that isn't true, but it sort of sounds like it could possibly be true, maybe. It could possibly be true, yes. Uh, a legend or a myth. A myth is a similar thing. And we make myths all the time about our own lives, because we have ideas about ourselves and who we are, which all aren't always necessarily true. I might think I'm the greatest historian in England, but probably several thousand other historians would think, mm, I don't think so, I think that's a bit of a myth. Uh, so we don't really think, do we, in 2021 that this could be true. But for a long time people did think it's true, and we sort of think, anyone heard of the Loch Ness Monster? Yeah. Okay, yeah, most of you. So there are some people who believe that's true, don't they? Even though we think, but it can't really be true. Um, and if you go to Limitster Church, and you look at the entrance of Limster Church, on the left, there was a great big gravestone against the wall. And the gravestone's got these funny markings on it. And the legend is that that is the grave of Jim Puttock who killed the dragon. And the markings on it represent the horrible scales of the dragon. So there's no name on it, but if that's the legend. And again, this shows you how clever these people were all those years ago. This is what's called an illuminated manuscript. So you know when I said about the monks and the nuns writing books? They also did, that was the, they do that, that's hand drawn with colours that would have been very difficult, very difficult to get coloured ink in those days. And that is over a thousand years old and it's still beautiful and it's still amazing how that was created. And the man here, so, so here we are, there's the Archbishop, uh, there's Mary, the Virgin Mary, and there's Jesus, and there are the angels, and that man looking up into heaven is King Edgar. Now, he wasn't Edgar the Great, he was Edgar the Peaceable, that was his name. Edgar the Peaceable, because when he was king, there were no wars, and people were safe. 
and uh, they were happy times. And so he's remembered as Edgar the Peaceable.